Well, let's put a clock on it. It's not a matter of if they're going to kill him, it's when. The other inmates will get to him, and they're going to have to hold him in close custody. Because, you know, when you get into a prison, people hate informants, rats, they hate child molesters. This guy killed his wife, pregnant wife, and his two kids. So they're going to have to watch him essentially forever. That was Larry Levine, a former federal inmate, talking about Chris Watts' prospects way back in sort of the latter part of November 2018. That is really the situation Chris Watts is facing all along, is if he was going to jail, he was going to face almost certain death in the prison population, which is probably what the DA knew and probably what his public defenders were telling him. And that is really, in essence, the plea deal that he was making with them, which was, um, you're not going to be put to death by a sort of a legal process, you're going to be put to death through this sort of illegal process of what happens in prisons. And the Weld County can kind of make a deal with you that way. Obviously, that's not the official version of events. I'm telling you that I, I believe that is the unofficial version of events. So welcome to Christopher Watts, What Else Do We Know, number 20. It's a Friday, Friday the 13th. It does seem to be a pretty unlucky year for many of us living in 2020 with the coronavirus. Here in South Africa, there are 24 cases, but... Africa as a whole has got far fewer doctors per thousand people than most other places in the world. So the stats here, I'm not sure, are very reliable. Anyway, I hope wherever you are, it is um, manageable and safe and you are working on your resilience. As with all things in life, as with all things in true crime, as with sickness and in health, divorce, death, Life must go on, mustn't it? So I'm, I'm going to take you through the remainder of November, just 10 points today. I need to be somewhere quite soon in about 90 minutes, so I need to make this short. So I'm going to take you through points 60 to 70, and, and that concludes the November section of what else do we know? For those new to the channel, I and or, or those new to the Robert Durst case, I'm covering all the courtroom coverage of the Durst case. We're already at day six, and day six was a really interesting day where Kathy Durst's siblings testified. I'll be putting up something on that later today, but I'm doing daily coverage of that, and that is a really fascinating case just because of the length of it, the breadth of it, the wealth of the alleged perpetrator, and he, and of course the most fascinating aspect is Durst himself. If Chris Watts is an, an enigma, so is Bob Durst. Then the next episode on Van Gogh will be on the 15th, when he wrote another letter after a long silence from the asylum. So that'll be on the 15th of March, which is Sunday, and that'll be obviously something he did 130 years ago today on that particular day. So if you're interested in that coverage, please subscribe to the channel, like, share, leave a comment, and let's get started. So I want to encourage you guys to go to the original blog post and listen to the full interview from this guy, Larry Levine. He's a former felon, a former inmate, so he sort of knows what he's talking about, I guess, in a sense. Of course, he's been wrong about Chris Watts being, I think, uh, later on in the interview, he says, I give him a year. In other words, within a year, Chris Watts will have been killed by his fellow inmates. Of course, at this time, he didn't know what, what, what was in the plea deal. We also don't know exactly what it was, but we do know that he was transferred to Dodge Correctional, and we know that about three months later, when Chris Watts was interviewed, he sounded pretty content, pretty happy, pretty safe, pretty secure, and a lot more so than 
in his accommodations in the Weld County Jail. In the previous episode, we started the process of just going through the chronology of what stuck out in the release of the discovery. So there was some initial reports in the media. The public took a while to get um, get access to those downloads that were going on. There was a lot of servers crashing, but it was this period where we everybody was sort of looking for what was interesting in the discovery. And of course, certain people found different things interesting. One channel, and I believe I provided that in the introduction of the previous episode, was sort of stating as fact that Chris Watts had had an affair with men as well, or a man as well. And that I don't believe is true. And so there was also a little bit of that where people were rushing to judgment, going through the, the discovery as if it was a kind of a gospel, but really the, the discovery is just a record of a lot of information. It's not an interpretation of it. That's what court cases are for. So let's go to point number 61 in the discovery. Shanann's phone, sorry, in the chronology. Shanann's phone and watch were retrieved from the loft couch under two cushions. I was pretty surprised by this just in the sense that it proved that someone was either leaking to HLN early on, remember they did a kind of a report on this, or just that HLN certainly had, I, I don't know, fingers in pies or knew what was going on. And uh, so I was quite impressed with that, but I was also quite intrigued to know how this was happening, where they were getting the information from as well. So this spe specific aspect came out of page 468 of the discovery documents. And it was this kind of thing that made one think that a trial was going to be absolutely fascinating in the, in the, um, in this particular case. One reason being, I don't know if I've ever seen a case that has got so much of a digital fabric of the whole thing. Shanann's, virtually Shanann's entire life was sort of documented on social media almost daily. Um, Chris Watts's life was also documented, although one could say involuntarily. So it, when he got into his work truck, the GPS would start pinging and sending a signal, and so all of his movements were being tracked as well. They had such a sophisticated home security system that people coming and going could be seen from two different cameras and then there were all sorts of um, motion detector sensors within the home as well and if that wasn't enough you also had the eye watches and to some extent the the iPhones that could track movements and so you were getting this incredible digital archive of, of the whole crime and I was certainly looking forward to seeing how this is going to play out in court and you know just how, what that was going to show and although all of this seemed very compelling in the beginning you know I think a lot of us thought when the body cam footage came out you know the actual video you know I thought a lot of us I think a lot of us thought we were going to get a lot more compared to what, what did come out. There was virtually no smoking gun crime scene evidence that we saw. In fact, if you think about everything that we see in the discovery, there's virtually nothing that is kind of like typical of a crime. There's no blood anywhere. There are no photos of bodies. There's no obvious crime scene anywhere. There is no time of death. There is no, there, there are no sort of evidence that people died except for unmade beds, which is pretty incredible. I mean, the, the most significant pieces of evidence are basically the bed sheet left at the well site, which is, if you think about it, not much to go on. And in the home, the excrement on the pillowcase. That's it. 
And I think as it turned out, one of the ways to defeat all of the, the let's call it the digital layers within the home and even to an extent outside of them, people have asked me, why didn't the camera, the, the ring doorbell camera of, from the Watts home, why didn't it pick up Chris Watts doing whatever he was doing on that side of the driveway, right? Including him walking to his truck. Why didn't why don't we see that? I think the answer is quite obvious. I think it's because he turned the router off. And as soon as you do that, you would kind of have a situation where the gadgets can't talk to one another. The security system can't communicate to his phone and so on and so on. Do you get what I'm saying? There are also simple ways to deactivate the the um, the Vivint system and that can be done both by a phone, so v v remotely, but it can also be done by turning off the router. So that is an interesting aspect is uh, one thing I would like to know from the phone data review or from the discoveries when did Chris Watts' phone connect to the router or Shanann's phone connect to the router um, from Sunday night, Monday morning onwards? Because that, that information should be available as well, right? And there is a sense that when, when uh, they found Shanann's phone under the couch and they turned it on, there was a moment where it then connected and got all the messages, right? And you can say, well, that is because the phone was off, yes, but also because the router may have been off prior to that. So all of this is very technical information. It would have been fascinating to get the official version, like in a courtroom, you know, this is exactly what the information shows us, and you actually have forensic experts, people that are experts at analyzing the phone data. And we had exactly that in the Patrick Frazee case, where the same guy who did the phone data analysis using Celebrite extraction technology, and that, of course, was CBI agent Kevin Hoyland. And his testimony at the Patrick Frazee trial was really incredible, just how they managed to track phones using the pinging with towers and all that sort of thing. And it was the kind of thing that we could have and should have heard in, if there was a, a trial in the Chris Watts case. By the way, just on that particular point, I have studied the um, cell phone records of Nicole Kessinger and the ping on the Frederick Tower on the, the morning of Monday morning, the 13th of August, is quite unusual. There weren't a lot of pings on, on the tower. There were actually a couple, but not a lot. The problem with the whole conspiracy that Kessinger was involved is it's at the wrong time. It's pinging at 6.30, I think, in the morning, which is when no one was home, and we know that. So it's kind of an interesting artifact, but it's not really a smoking gun the way some people are making it out to be. Number 62, Trent Bolt is mentioned in the discovery documents. However, none of the text messages claim to have been exchanged between Watson Bolt form part of the documents. Number 63, the sentiment toward towards Nicole Kessinger appears to be shifting and this was from a tweet by Rebecca Patrick Howard and she talks about how her own feelings towards Nicole Kessinger who, who she initially regarded as a victim had now changed. She said clearly my opinion has changed because she discovered that Kessinger had been googling him and telling him to pawn the ring, which he, she certainly did, deleting pictures, lying in interviews, and all that kind of thing. I would argue that the feelings towards Nicole Kessinger have always been very black or very white. I don't really get the feeling that there were too many thinking of her as the, the victim, and 
today people kind of seem to go the one way or the other with most people uh, hating on her considering her basically an accessory and I think in that sense she has been victimized number 64 a new mugshot of Chris Watts was released it provided Watts's weight as 225 pounds and uh, to be honest when I looked at the, the, the mugshot it seemed like a photo from his past I mean it really Chris, it didn't look at all like Chris Watts. It didn't look like the Silver Fox. He didn't look handsome or polished. or He didn't look like the guy that gave the sermon on the porch at all. He looked like an average Joe. He looked like a very ordinary schmo. And obviously it gained quite a lot of weight since the photo was taken. Something that I pick up later on in the chron chronology. Number 65, three terabytes of data, including photos and videos, are set to be released within the next few days. And I think everyone was pretty excited about that. In true crime, this kind of amount of data just handed over was absolutely unprecedented. I think the reason for it was when people should have been talking about the plea deal and was it right, was it ethical, was it coerced all those kinds of conversations when that should have been happening instead they were jumping to look into the discovery and you know kind of like a, a it was like a free-for-all and that is where the conversation then went it, it went to the discovery which was basically a lot much ado about nothing I mean there's a lot of information in there but very little of any substance there were no real crime scene photos for example where you sort of saw okay this is something there was, there was very little analysis of evidence forensic analysis saying we tested this for DNA or whatever whatever and this is what came up there, wa there was a little bit of that with the autopsy and the toxicology report but even that seemed watered down didn't it Number 66, CBI interrogation of Trent Bolt and Damien Ferns. So that is something that I um, put up on Crime Rocket. It was, in the, it was in the discovery from page 740 onwards. In that interrogation, Coda initially tells Trent Bolt he doesn't believe him and then later on tells him that he does. So make of that what you will number 67 Chris Watts appeared to have gained 40 pounds 18 kilograms in a remarkably short period of time so th that kind of shows you when you took away thrive and exercise and and you sort of put in the jail food Chris Watts put on quite a lot of weight within three months his, his life really changed very very quickly number 68 an article in the mirror which is a British publication British tabloid Chris Watts treated his daughters to pizza and then let them FaceTime their granddad just hours before he murdered them I don't think that headline is accurate in in a few ways for example the pizza was cold pizza apparently leftovers from the day before so it wasn't as if he just went out and ordered pizza Sunday night in fact he didn't actually make it seemed as if he didn't even make his children dinner on the night of their deaths which I think is quite interesting he did let them FaceTime their grandfather on their mother's side but not their grandfather on on his side of the family which is also quite interesting when the mirror says just hours before he murdered them it's that's the question did he do this minutes before he murdered them or hours um, did did he feed them this meal and and what was the a sedative or something in a milkshake or in a whatever was that part of the process or not bear in mind that no petitial hemorrhages in the children and no marks around their necks so 
it doesn't look like they were strangled or smothered. I'm talking about in terms of the forensic evidence. So one way to get them to ingest a sedative or something that could overdose them is through their meal, right? As I say, he didn't put a lot of effort into giving them a meal. And he often spoke about how he was missing them, throwing chicken nuggets at him. And I don't really think that is something he missed. I think it, it was something he that he felt humiliated and didn't like. You know, that was something about dinner time that he wasn't looking forward to. Uh, the other aspect, and I've brought this up quite a few times, is Shanann did ask Chris Watts to send her photos of the children asleep in bed, and he didn't. Instead, what he did was he sent photos from early in the day. That, to me, is a very strong sign, almost a 100% sign that the children were dead by then. And you might say, oh, well, you know, he just didn't send the right pictures or whatever. But the fact is, earlier, whenever she asked for pictures, he would send them to her, including earlier on Sunday. So why not send them when she asked? Well, because he couldn't. By the way, it is a fact that when someone overdoses, they do turn blue. And you can also say, well, him saying that, the, that someone turned blue was simply a lie, some things are lies, but the fact that he would come up with something like that suggests that it was, was something that he saw. And people turning blue are a sign of overdose. You can, you can Google it. You can Google the symptoms of overdose in terms of, in terms of what it looks like. Number 69, and this is where the Celebrite software ran into a couple of problems. It actually says this in the discovery that it wasn't it wasn't completely straightforward getting the data that they wanted from the secret calculator app. So if you go to discovery page two two zero seven nine, there's a reference to locating those transferred images proved challenging and was predicated on mere curiosity. According to the officer, and this wasn't, this wasn't Kevin Hoyland, it was someone else. I think his name was um, Detective Michael Prill from the Greeley Police Department. So what he said was that he found... 12,000 images on Watts's phone within the secret calculator app. Now, if you consider that there are 12,000 images on Watts's phone, and you imagine how many we've actually seen of those images, it can't be more than 10. So one of the things I've emphasized in my books, and I've tried to emphasize quite often is Chris Watts is the kind of guy who hides behind a mask in plain sight. His mask is very plausible. It's right in front of you and yet you don't necessarily see it. And there are many examples of this, but one good example is the secret calculator app, which is you've got this benign looking little icon on the front of your phone and yet it is the key to unlocking this secret life that is leading. But it, at, at face value, it looks absolutely normal, doesn't it? And Chris Watts, much about him and much about this crime, is exactly the same way. The entire affair is hidden within that period where Shanann goes to North Carolina. The entire murder and disposal of the bodies is hidden within the thing of I've arrived at home from a birthday party. I'm now going to barbecue, go to bed, and go to work. And, oh, what's the problem? Did, did, did something happen? That's the way he's hidden things away. And I kind of get the idea Chris Watts has lived his whole life like that, where he has always made things look the way he thinks people know them to look. And 
if people have made assumptions that are, are wrong in certain areas, then he has allowed them to think the most obvious thing. In conclusion, I just want to come back to the thing that Levine spoke about right in the beginning, where he said the prison population were going to kill Chris Watts. You know, the minute they got their hands on him, they would kill him. And so, you know, he wasn't going to last. So if you consider what Levine was saying, that the authorities knew they were going to have to watch this guy for the rest of his life. No matter what happened to Chris Watts, in terms of his confinement, he, he was going to need to be uh, carefully supervised. And what I don't think Chris Watts realized was the plea deal that he got was one that he would need to get anyway. In other words, this protective custody in jail was something that was the authority's responsibility. But they could theoretically use this as a ruse to say, you know what, we're going to put you in the prison population, you're not going to last a day, or you're not going to last a month. And he would have reason to be afraid of that. So that is a theory of mine. I can't prove it, but I think it has some basis, don't you? But if you think about the psychology of that whole theory within this context of if the second version is more horrible, it must be true. So if you think about the law enforcement's role in this. So you say, did law enforcement trick Chris Watts and whatever? Or did Chris Watts realize what position he was in and in terms of an actual death penalty? And that is why he took the plea deal. And think about those two different concepts within the mindfuckery of if the second version is more horrible it must be true it's kind of it's kind of a bit confusing isn't it when you think of it like that for me the chris watts case isn't that complicated in terms of the basicness of the crime and i think what does make it quite complicated is the huge amount of information but it just requires sifting through that and then saying okay this is this is what we have so the amount of information makes it somewhat complicated, but what we end up with is still a basic, a, quite a simple um, crime and execution. The most fascinating aspect for me is how in the Chris Watts case, very little of what you see is actually what's going on. In other words, you left to decide what actually happened. And what you're seeing is not necessarily true. And as a result of this, you have this enormous spectrum of people choosing to believe whatever they want to believe. And that is where you need discernment and a little bit of experience with true crime to say, okay, that's possible, but is it likely? And one of the ways that you can anchor all of the speculation to something tangible, even though it is somewhat intangible, is you say, what is the actual identity of this guy? How does he normally behave? How does he think about things? How does he do things? And if you don't know the psychology, you're not going to be able to do that. Conversely, if you're good at the psychology, if you put the right label on Chris Watts, and ideally you shouldn't even put a label on him, but if you put him into the right, if you have the right handle on his identity, then you are going to be able to figure out what very, very likely happened. And I think that is the difference between true crime rocket science and the rest. I don't think Chris Watts taking Bella to the well site fits in with any of that hiding in plain sight stuff. Although it could show, you know, of all the family members, Chris Watts did have a particular soft spot for Bella, certainly at one stage. And she for him, I mean, she sang that song, My Daddy's a Hero. The question is, how relevant was it when Chris Watts had predetermined that he was going to commit a triple murder, where he was going to put their bodies, and also the fact that his mind was completely addled with his obsession with Nicole Kessinger. So a lot of those relationships with his own unborn child, his wife, 
C.C. Bella, his home, his house, all of that kind of just fell by the wayside. He was willing to give all of that up for a woman. Almost the opposite of that, someone who didn't want to give any of what he had up for a woman is Robert Durst. And so we're coming to the very interesting part dealing with the dynamics between the siblings, Durst siblings, and also Kathy McCormack's siblings. Uh, she became Kathy Durst. So I'm dealing with that in the daily coverage of the Durst trial. So please go and check that out. There's some very interesting parallels to Durst becoming standoffish and dismissive Kurt and Cole to his wife before she disappeared. And there's another example where Robert Durst said something like, I don't know where my wife went, she vanished. You know, she disappeared. And that was the end of that. He wasn't charged, nothing really happened. Within sort of a very few months, I think it was by March, she disappeared in at the very end of January 1982. By March, the police were telling Kathy Durst's family that it was already a cold case. So if you had been following the Durst case, you might have thought, yes, if someone just disappears, it's easy to get away with murder. So please subscribe to this channel if you want to get regular updates on the Durst trial coverage. There are already, uh, I think, five episodes up, so go and check them out. I provide audio from the trial and, where possible, images as well and uh, press coverage, similar to what I did in the Fraser e case. In terms of Patreon, at the moment I'm uploading an audiobook, Blood and Seawater. I'm already at Chapter 9 or 10. Um, the bad news for you guys is I'm going to shift this series Christopher Watts, what else do we know, to Patreon. So from now on, it'll be there. I will provide you with little intros to the successive episodes on this channel, but they will probably not be much longer than um, five minutes or so. So it'll just be a little brief intro to what we're doing. Um, I'm moving that to Patreon just because I'm a little bit tired of the negative comments that I get here. I'm also a little bit tired of the uh, people who don't like me, don't like how I speak, don't like my voice, don't like how I try to sort of um, base what I'm saying on facts. That's why I'm thinking about it. Um, I don't write a script out. Uh, I'm certainly not going to go to all that effort for a free channel and um, you know, make it in an entertaining way that's acceptable to everyone. Um, I'm certainly not going to do that. So, so um, I would like to do that, but I'm going to be doing that for money. Though I'm not going to be doing it for free. So that'll be on the Patreon channel from now on, uh, from 21 onwards. I'll also be doing a live on Sunday at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Not quite sure if that's still the right time because of daylight savings, but it is 5 o'clock or 1700 uh, SAST, so you can check that out. That's also on Patreon. As for me, it's a sunny day here in South Africa. The, uh, there are a lot of fluffy clouds out there after quite a lot of rain. It's been exceptionally wet and somewhat, I wouldn't even say mild winter, it was warm, oh, not winter, summer. Um, instead of being as very hot and very dry as it's been the last couple of years. So we're certainly grateful my garden is bursting out of its seams. The trees are really, have really grown a lot in a short time. And I've even got swallows that are, are building a nest right now. They're supposed to be getting ready to fly home and they're kind of building a nest. So that's quite um, quite intriguing. It's quite also interesting just watching them build their nest and, you know, what, what goes on with them, what they like, what they don't like. And I mean that compared to other garden birds that have also got nesting in my garden. You just see how different organisms have different things that that, that they need and that suit them. And when you recognize that with the smallest creature, and even with certain plants, some that like to be in the sun, some that need shade, some that 
need to be dry, some that need soil that drains, some that need rocks or whatever it is, some that need a certain kind of acidity or alkalinity in the soil. Um, you realize how people are a lot like that as well. People need their space as well. People need to be in a certain amount of control as well. And when they're not, they sometimes take the law into their own hands. Thank you for listening and uh, have a good weekend and I'll see you guys next time.